Hello, I'm Stephen Gard. I invite you to join me on a journey down the old Hume Highway through the pages of my book, Once Upon a Hume. In volume one, we'll start from Leppington and we'll travel down to Mittagong. Or to put it another way, we'll start with Mr. William Cordeaux and finish with Mr. George Cutter. On the way, we'll meet with a whole gallery of fascinating folk who once lived on the old Hume Highway. The Once Upon a Hume series is a traveller's companion intended to enliven your journey down the old Hume Highway. It's rather like having a knowledgeable and amiable comrade who can enliven a long journey with stories about the places through which one is passing. Once Upon a Hume takes the reader on a journey down the old Hume Highway, not town by town, but story by story. In our first volume, we begin with a discussion of roads and road making, and the fact that the Great South Road, as it was first known, was created by people, not governments. We discuss settlement, migration, the urge to pioneer and profit. We explore the importance of the motoring lobby in pushing for improved roads and the changes this caused in the towns and villages of southwest New South Wales. And then we begin our journey at Leppington, or with Mr William Cordeaux of the government's commissariat, and we consider how he and a handful of other well-to-do colonial families were set on creating a new Australian gentry and a new set of home counties in southwest Sydney and the colony of New South Wales and why it never came to pass. The Great South Road begins at the crossroads near Liverpool where it turns southwards, away from the city. Roads were a huge problem for the colony of New South Wales. Some would say they still are. With great distances to travel, road making became something of an Australian speciality, as well as a necessity. With next to no government funding available, turnpike roads were the only option to make and maintain decent roads. Short stretches of them anyway. This is a circular toll house, and it was designed so the toll keeper could keep an eye out in both directions along the road. Here's a picture of the turnpike gate on the Parramatta Road. The design matches the old Roman gates at Roman settlements. You'll see doorways for persons on foot, and a much larger central portion for wagons and coaches and people on horseback. Turnpikes were never popular with colonists. The tolls asked sometimes amounted to extortion. Prices were not always advertised, so the public was not quite sure what they ought to be charged. The tolls collected were supposed to be spent on upkeep of that particular stretch of road. But the toll road leases were auctioned by government, and so the costs had to be recovered. Hence the differing charges from those trying to make a profit. The Great South Road followed two routes with a turnpike section on each. There was the Campbelltown Road, which has a better claim to being the Great South Road. On this stretch of road, the toll gate was at Denham Court. In 1850, it was leased for a sum of £164 to Mr Joseph Moore, as in Moorbank. The other route was the Cowpasture Road, which passed through Camden, the stronghold of the MacArthur family. So there was another toll gate at Carnes Hill. The gate at Carnes Hill did better business than the gate at Denham Court because it collected from two thoroughfares. These were the Cowpasture Road, which it maintained, and the Brinjelli Road, which it didn't maintain. There were bitter complaints from Brinjelli Road users about the bad state of that road, yet they had to pay toll for it too. Mr Joseph Moore was a wily fellow. Mr Moore's keeper at the Denham Court tollgate used to send scouts out to wait at the cow pasture road. If they saw anyone travelling with a flock of animals to the Sydney markets, they would persuade that person to take the next road right 
past Mrs Cordo's Leppington house. They would then pass these person through the Denham Court gate at half price. The government threatened to put another gate on that side road if Mr Moore kept up his poaching activities. The only solution, of course, was a central government authority charged with road making and maintenance at the taxpayer's expense. But that did not arrive until the age of the motor car. We mentioned Mrs Cordeaux and Leppington House. William Cordeaux was deputy assistant of the government commissariat. He arrived in Sydney Cove in 1818 as a young half-pay officer. There's not much to tell of him. He was a minor government official and the name Cordeaux attached to the Cordeaux River and the Cordeaux Dam honours his son, not himself. He comes into our Hume Highway story because he was among that handful who were sure they would become Australia's nobility. The idea was later dismissed as a bunyip aristocracy. Like many senior government officials, Cordo acquired a portion of Western Sydney by grant in the expectation that he would, if not dwell there, at least improve and work the land, raise a crop or graze stock and feed the colony and also provide employment for the large convict workforce. Cordeaux built himself a McMansion, which he named Leppington Hall, in honour of a town near his birthplace. Cordeaux himself died in 1839, and the estate passed out of the family's possession ten years later. Leppington Hall was just one of several such park-like estates established by would-be squires. Some remain, some have vanished but most are recalled in the names of southwestern Sydney suburbs, Denham Court, Varroville, Gledswood, and the people, Robert Townsend, Sarah Redfern, James Meehan, John Warby. As long ago as 1832, a visitor to this area foretold that there was no chance of it ever becoming like the great landed estates on the British model. He wrote, the land was distributed in large grants whereby the population were widely scattered and the middle and the lower orders of the people who are necessary to the construction of a community were consequently excluded. And so, not finding land and dwelling places procurable, sought for them elsewhere and left this neighbourhood solely in the hands of the great landholders. The latter are not capable of forming the chain of society alone because the intermediate and connecting links are wanting. It wasn't until the middle of the 20th century that the necessary population infill began to arrive, mostly in the form of market gardeners. The grand plan for Australian aristocracy came to nothing. one old Hume Highway character we know a bit more about. His name's Charles Louis Runke. His name appears on this map of the Picton area of the old Hume Highway. The red line shows the Great South Road before the freeway came through Wilton and Pheasant's Nest. So who was Charles Louis Runke? He was born in Germany in 1788, coincidentally the date of the first fleet arriving in Australia, and his full name was Karl Ludwig Christian Rumka. And though his father was a builder, Rumka became an astronomer. He also served in the Royal Navy. Now how did that come about, a German serving in the Royal Navy? Well, I invite you to read the book and find out all about it. Rumka was brought to Australia by Governor Sir Thomas Brisbane as one of a pair of pet astronomers to staff the Governor's private observatory at Parramatta. Rumke immediately justified the Governor's investment by spotting the comet Enki on the 2nd of June 1822. 
In return for his services as an astronomer, Rumke was rewarded by the governor with a thousand acres at Stone Quarry, which we now know as Picton. Rumke did nothing about settling this grant until he quarrelled with Governor Brisbane. What was their quarrel about? I invite you to read all about it in Once Upon a Hume. In 1823, Rumka stormed off from the Parramatta Observatory and moved to his stone quarry property near Picton. And there he became a grazier and agriculturalist. He didn't make an astronomical amount of money, but he was a good master, well liked by his convict servants. He was also something of an eccentric, and he continued his astronomic studies from the top of Picton's Red Bank Hill under which the old tunnel now runs and where the Picton Town Water Reservoir stands. What did he spot from up there? And what happened to Karl Romka afterwards? Did he stay in Picton? You can read the rest of his story in Once Upon a Hume. Here's a map from the 1840s showing Sir Thomas Mitchell's new line of road which was planned to avoid the Razorback Range. It follows what is today the Hume Motorway and joins the Great South Road again at Lupton's Inn. What was Lupton's Inn? Who was this Lupton? John Lupton was a convict, probably an agricultural rioter protesting against the introduction of machinery to British farmlands. Whatever his crime, John was almost immediately assigned to handle cattle, which suggests that he had worked with them before. Now Mary too had been a convict, but her story is more dramatic. Mary Leighton was born in Sydney. She was either the eldest child or the eldest daughter of Jack the Miller Leighton, an ex-convict. Jack Leighton set up one of the earliest mills in the colony, on the site of what is now the Sydney Observatory. For providing the infant colony with flour, he received in return land grants, which amounted to much of what is now called Miller's Point. In 1822, and at the age of 15, Mary Leighton forged, or was persuaded by her brother David Leighton to forge, an order on the commissariat for 45 pounds and six pence, quite a large sum of money. Now in the normal course of events, Mary might have been hanged for this offence. Instead, she was sentenced to transportation for life. One asks, how could Mary Leighton be sentenced to transportation when she already lived in New South Wales? What it meant was that Mary Leighton would become an assigned convict servant for the rest of her life. She would not be allowed to leave the colony. She would remain, in effect, a slave. How did she manage to avoid such a fate and become the owner of the prosperous Lupton's Inn? And why did John Lupton suddenly die? You can read all about it in Once Upon a Hume. But Mary Lupton's story is not yet half told. Now the date is 1836 and Mary Lupton is a widow, aged 36, with five children, the eldest barely a teenager. She's running Lupton's Inn with their help. Mary was not exactly penniless. And she was a shrewd manager and had inherited property from the Leighton estate in Sydney, as you'll see if you read Once Upon a Hume. Now, Mr Joseph A. Jones of Sutton Forest owned horses and he had some expertise in the coaching business. Mary had an inn at Bargo and she leased another at Maroolan, an important coaching stop on the Great South Road. So. It was a sensible plan for the two of them to get married, and they began a coaching line from Sydney to Goulburn. Their coaching business was fraught with difficulties. Coaching was a hazardous enterprise. Firstly, you had to own lots of horses to change them all up and down the route. And these horses had to be stabled, they had to be fed, shod, and their health looked after, and all this cost money. And you had to have coaches, and they had to be in good condition. You had to have skilled coachmen who did more than just drive. They were like tour guides as well as mechanics, diplomats, handymen and expert horsemen. It was not unknown for coachmen to have to get down off the coach and fix a bridge before the coach could cross it. As a coach line operator, you hoped for the government mail contract to cover some of your expenses. 
The payment was small, but it was something. What nearly destroyed the Jones coaching service was expensive compensation lawsuits by a couple of persons injured in the almost inevitable coaching accidents. There was sometimes bitter rivalry between coach lines and some dirty tricks were pulled in trying to attract custom. In 1854, Mary was widowed once again. What happened to Joseph H. Jones? Ah, read Once Upon a Hume. By the 1860s, Mary Jones was in financial difficulties. She was bedeviled by her brother David Leighton, who was something of a rogue and who had suddenly reappeared on the scene and was trying to diddle Mary out of the Leighton properties in Sydney. Her inn in Bargo was losing money, as were most such hostelries on the Great South Road. The arrival of the railway took away both freight and passenger traffic. The new line ran west from Picton, avoiding the Bargo brush. Many towns along the Great South Road felt the impact. Some little settlements just dried up and blew away. Mary commenced a battle with the New South Wales Parliament for compensation. She claimed that her coaching line as a government mail carrier had gone into the red due to the drought, affecting the prices of feed and a shortage of labour due to the gold rushes and there were other factors. She also fought Parliament for two decades for compensation over the Millers Point land, which Mary asserted that her brother David had sold without her permission. And did she win her compensation cases? You can read about it in Once Upon a Hill. And so we move on down the Great South Road. In Yerenbool, we find Mrs. Sophie Corrie. Early in the 20th century, Mrs. Corrie won notoriety as a maker of preserved fruit and an authority on orcharding. But when I came to explore further, I found there was rather a lot of fiction or perhaps hyperbole amongst the ingredients of her story. The tale she told to the world in her later years was of a struggling widow left with six children who selected land and cleared and cultivated it with her own hands, facing terrible challenges and difficulties, homeschooling all her children and establishing an orchard in a wilderness. She became an expert on the growing and preserving of fruit and a lot more besides. Sophie was the daughter of John Wheeler, a publican, and Elizabeth Prumby, a former nanny. Grandfather Wheeler had been a convict. These were facts Mrs. Corrie preferred to gloss over later in life because she became an ardent advocate of temperance. Her parents had also owned considerable property in Strawberry Hills, including hotels. While quite a young woman, Sophie Corrie married a young Irish doctor, but he died two years later. She then married Charles Pittman Corrie, formerly a Melbourne-based ironmonger who sold equipment to hopeful diggers as they stepped off the boat from Europe and set out for the Bendigo and other Victorian gold diggings. Charles Corrie then came to Sydney and married Sophie. He transformed himself into a mining broker, riding on the crest of the copper ore wave of the 1870s. The Corrie family lived like royalty. And then one day... Ah, but read Once Upon a Hume to find out what happened to them. Mrs. Corrie found herself a widow with five children and another on the way. She sold up and moved to what is today the Southern Highlands. Now here is where the struggling widow myth begins. And unfortunately there are several stories to her discredit. I leave the reader to explore them. The Corrie family of Yerenbool were eccentrics and not perhaps ideal neighbours although Mrs. Corrie was an expert fruit canner and maker of preserves and on that her fame rested for a long time. The property she called Tea Tree must have indeed been a veritable Garden of Eden, but it was never a commercial orchard as she tried to suggest, nor can it be taken seriously as an agricultural research or experimental station. Sophie Corrie was in fact a hobby farmer, plain and simple, and not in any sense was she short of means. She inherited money and property from her family and from both marriages. 
She was a prize exhibitor of her preserved fruits at country shows in the Berrimah district, and then she moved further afield, taking on the Royal Easter Show as well, and became a show judge even at places where she had not been invited to attend. Mrs Corrie had her life story printed as a pamphlet, and she handed it out to journalists wherever she went. She published a book about preserving and canning, which sold well, but canning went out of favour. You can read Sophie Corrie's story in Once Upon a Hue. Once Upon a Hume, on the Great South Road, stood the Kangaroo Inn. Its proprietor was Mr George Cutter, and let us not beat about the bush, Mr George Cutter was a rogue. Surprisingly, George Cutter had not come to Australia as a convict, but as a free settler. In fact, as a former soldier who had fought with Wellington at the Battle of Waterloo, and the record seems to bear out his claim. Cutter and his wife Anne arrived at Sydney Cove in 1820 and at once went into business. Anne stocked a magpie's nest of goods the couple had purchased from the ship's cargo, and George established a blacksmithing shop. He claimed also to be adept at horse doctoring. Since he had served as a driver of wagons for Wellington, Cutter may indeed have been expert in such matters. But Cutter was an angry and brutal fellow, and his convict servants hated him. He struggled with his business, making more enemies than customers, and found himself in court on more than one occasion. Small wonder then, that in 1827 the Cutters left Sydney town and opened an inn, amongst the first down that way, to the east of the present town of Mittagong. The Kangaroo Inn stood at the foot of Rose Hill, over which the original Great South Road climbed. Cutter was almost immediately in trouble with his guests, and his neighbours and his servants. A young lass in his service claimed Cutter had attempted to ravish her. Cutter was merely fined for this offence, but the lass went home to her family. It seems remarkable that such a man was allowed to carry on the responsible trade of publican, but the young colony of New South Wales was in no position to be choosy. Anyone could be a publican who was not a convict, and anyone who had the energy to start up an enterprise which would employ convict servants was encouraged to do so by the government and supplied from the government's commissariat store to get them started. Cutter was hardly the type to be a friendly innkeeper. Anne took care of that side of things. George's business interests were wider. He operated a mill, supplied building stone for the Berrima courthouse and raised beef cattle. Some of this cattle was not his own property, but stolen from other Great South Road graziers. George Cutter repeatedly found himself in court facing prosecution by his neighbours or his creditors. One of his neighbours was former explorer Captain Charles Sturt, who wrote to his brother that Cutter is a villain and needs to be removed from the neighbourhood. Cutter's removal from the neighbourhood came about simply because Sir Thomas Mitchell realigned the Great South Road to avoid the cruel climb up Rose Hill, where many a beast of burden died of exhaustion. Cutter accordingly moved the kangaroo in westwards and sublet the business to a series of people with whom he quarrelled, usually violently. One managerial dispute cost Cutter six months in prison, but worse was to come. Cutter's next quarrel in 1839, and with a different manager of the Kangaroo Inn, resulted in Cutter stabbing his client, though not fatally. This assault cost Cutter 15 years in jail, and he was transported to Van Diemen's land to serve his sentence. That ought to have removed Cutter from the district just about permanently, but he served only six years, being released in 1845. George Cutter returned to Mittagong to find the Kangaroo Inn in the hands of Alexander Brand, one of his convict servants, who seems also to have become Anne Cutter's lover. The situation drove the irascible Cutter into a fury that amounted almost to madness, and for the rest of his life 
he attacked Alexander Brand with every means at his disposal until the day came when Cutter decided to finalise matters. So what did the violent and irrational George Cutter do? I invite you to read Once Upon a Hume and discover the full story. We've met just a few characters who appear in Volume 1 of Once Upon a Hume. There are a good many others, and all of them have a story to tell. In Volume 2 of Once Upon a Hume, we'll meet some more interesting folk. We'll explore some more intriguing places and discover some more unusual circumstances. The town clocks of Mittagong, Barrel and Camden, and the fierce battles of the Chimes. The concentration camp at Berrimer. Grace Perry, Berrimer's Black Swan. The fabulous Sally of Sally's Corner. Heroic Black Bob of Black Bob's Creek. The Tank Bank taking old Hume towers with a bang. Bruce Lewin, the wandering yarn spinner. The hapless alpacas of Arthursley. The Richter murder mystery. The Maroolan Tiger. Goldman's Billy Cart Ballyhoo. And such a lot more. True story. Thanks for joining me. And I hope you'll join me again when we journey down the old Hume Highway. <laughs>